Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's been a great pleasure to be here. Um, I want to start by asking you all a question. Who really, really loves testing? Oh, well, a, a few, but, but not very many. So I didn't really used to enjoy it very much either, but then I uh, co-invented QuickCheck. <laughs> so, so why is testing hard, fundamentally? Well, suppose you're, you're writing automated tests for a system, and you've got, say, n features that you want to test. What are you going to do? You're going to write maybe three or four tests per feature, right? That's OK. That's a linear amount of work. But we all know that you won't catch all of the bugs that way, because there are some bugs that only appear when you use two features together. Oh. Well, if you want to test for all of those possibilities, then you've got to write a quadratic number of test cases. That's starting to sound not so much fun. And actually, some bugs don't appear just when you use two things together. Sometimes you need to use three things together to provoke them. If you want to test for all of those, you're going to be writing a cubic number of test cases. And this is really starting to sound like a lot of work. And what about race conditions? They're the worst of the lot. Because by definition, a race condition involves an interaction be between at least two features. And What's worse, it doesn't even strike every time you run the same test. So, you know, ah, this is horrible. So this is why testing is hard. You can't test everything. You can't test enough. So when are you going to stop? What's the answer? Don't write tests. <laughs> Generate them. And that's what I'm going to talk about. It's what I've been doing for quite a few years now. Um, the original Haskell Quick Check, which perhaps many of you have uh, come across, is something that Kuhn Klassen and I came up with 15 years ago. Uh, in 2006, then I started Cubic, uh, marketing a, a version in Adlang. And since then, we've added many, many extensions. And we found a lot of uh, very fun bugs for Ericsson and Volvo Cars and, and Basho and, uh, and many others. So what is QuickCheck? Well, it's a random testing tool. And the most common way that we use it is we take an API under test. And um, often the APIs that we want to test are not purely functional, sadly. But there we are. So in order to test the API, it's not enough just to make one call we generate a random sequence of calls. And then maybe that test will pass. If so, we generate another. And we keep doing that until we generate a sequence that fails. Now, when a sequence of calls fails a test, it turns out that it's almost always uh, because of just a few calls in that sequence. So when you generate your sequence at random, you have a whole lot of irrelevant stuff um, that is mixed in with the few calls that actually provoke the bug. So the next thing that we do is the shrinking process that you might have seen Reed Draper talk about. We search for those calls that are really necessary to provoke the failure, and we generate a minimal failing example. And that's then what we report to the user for debugging. I'm going to show you an example of using QuickCheck. I'm going to test a little bit of C code. It's a very simple example, but it illustrates testing uh, code with side effects. Uh, it's going to be a circular buffer. So there's going to be a call to create a new one. Here's a circular buffer with three slots. And uh, it's going to have an input pointer and an output pointer. And then there'll be an operation to put something in, which just increments the input pointer. And there'll be an operation to ask how many elements are in the buffer right now. And of course, there'll be an operation to take things out again. So standard circular buffer. And of course, when we reach the end of the buffer, then each of these pointers is going to wrap around. So you can imagine that it's quite simple to write this code. But maybe the size operation is a little trickier than the other two. 
And uh, here's the code I wrote for it. I think it's, it obviously works. I just take the difference between the input and the output pointers. That's what the Q arrow in and Q arrow out are. And then I take that difference modulo the size of the buffer. Bound to work. <laughs> so how do we test this kind of code? Well, um, the approach we found works well is to use a state machine model. What do I mean by that? We generate test cases, as I said, that are sequences of API calls. But then we also model the state of the system in some simple way. And for each API call, we define a state transition function that tells us how the model state changes. And then we write post conditions that compare the results of the real API calls to the state of the model. OK, that's a bit abstract. Oh, I should say all of this stuff, my specification is always written in Erlang. Uh, not closure, I'm afraid, but you can't have everything. <laughs> but this is a little abstract. Let's see how it applies to this circular buffer example. Well, I might generate a test case that looks like this. You put one, you put two, you get something out. You put three, you get something else out. Hmm, how can I model declaratively the state of that buffer? Let's see. Maybe the list of integers that I think should be in the state. So my green model is going to start off as the empty list. After I put one, it'll be the list containing one. After I put two, it's the list containing one and two, and so on. And now, my post conditions will just compare the result. Well, the result of get is the only interesting one in this case, and check that get actually returns the head of the list. Here's the specification of get. We write specifications by defining a number of callbacks, callback functions that are then invoked by QuickCheck as we run tests. So get has a precondition. Um, S there is the model state. And it's slightly more complex than in my diagram. The state is a record. And that S hash state dot putter, that's Erlang's notation for accessing a record field. So what the precondition says is that the pointer must not be undefined. That means you've got to call new before you can call get. Makes sense, right? And also, the contents of the queue must not be empty. You shouldn't call get if it is. The next definition is the state transition function. It says when you call get, then the model state afterwards just has the contents equal to the tail of the model contents before. And the last bit is the post condition. It just says that the actual result that is returned uh, from get should be equal to the head of the list of contents. So as you can see, they're very, very simple, pure functions that form the specification of get. And the other operations are specified equally simply. So let's run some tests. Um, oops. What has happened? The right thing. Good. So I have a, I'll show you the C code in a minute. Um, but in order to run these tests, I will need to um, compile my C code. I'm running this in the Erlang REPL. And um, this is, I've just invoked GCC in the background. I'll need to compile my specification. And now I can run quick check and I can give it the property uh, that is in my specification as an argument. And oh, OK, there's something wrong with my C code. Now, what you see here is, let me get my. A whole lot of output. First of all, oh, this was, this was the random test that initially failed. And then it got shrunk down a bit to this. And what I want you to look at is this bit. This is a kind of pretty printed trace of the test that lets us see what actually happened. So I called Q new to create a queue of size 1. And that returned a pointer to a queue with that address. And then I called put to put 0 into it. And then I asked for the size. And the size was 0. That's not consistent with my model. The post condition it says that 0, what I actually got, was not equal to 1. So what happened there? Well, I just put something into the queue, right? There should be one thing in it. 
but size returns zero. That can't be right. Let's look at my code. Here's the size function. So you saw the test case. The Q is of size one. So I took, or I took the difference between the input and output pointers modulo one. But everything modulo one is zero. So when the Q is of size one, this size function always returns zero. Oh dear, that, well that can't be right. Okay, um, but let me just demonstrate the, uh, the Q to you with a little example. I'll create a Q of size three just to show you that it normally behaves as we'd expect. We've got a pointer back. Whoops. Let's put one into the Q. Let's get something out of the Q. We've got one. Let's get something else. You see? It behaves just as you expect. <laughs> There's the one again. OK, but obviously, the size function wasn't right. OK, so what, if you think about it, this isn't a problem just for queues of size one. My input and output pointer wrap around when they reach the end of the buffer. So if I've got a queue of size n and I fill it full, the input pointer is going to wrap around back to zero. And now my input and output pointers are both going to be zero just as in an empty queue. This is the problem. I can't tell an empty queue apart from a full queue. What shall I do? Any ideas? Well, I could, for example, here's my representation. This is the struct that represents queues. There's the input and output pointer and the size and the pointer to where I keep the data. I could put a Boolean in here, couldn't I? to keep track of whether it's full or empty. But <laughs> that would be horrible special case code. No, 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 no. Let me show you a beautiful hack. <laughs> the only problem is when the queue gets full. So when I'm asked to create a queue of size n, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create one of size m plus 1. OK, this is where I allocate the data. This is where I initialize the size field. I just put m plus 1 in both those places. And now, if anybody puts, actually fills my cube and puts m plus 1 things in, it's their fault. <laughs> because they asked for a queue of size n. So I can avoid blame. <laughs> and this is, of course, the true purpose of all good software engineering. <laughs> OK, so I fixed that. Let me uh, <laughs> recompile my C code. And now I will just rerun uh, the last test that failed, which I can do if I just re take away the quick check. That will re rerun the last test. And it passes. OK, so that's good. By the way, that hack, it's the standard textbook fix for this problem. I only found that out after I started showing it to people. But um, that's it. So. Now I fixed the bug, and surely it now works, but let's just run some more tests. Oh, darn. It failed again. OK, what happened? I created a queue of size 1. OK. 1, that's really 2. Don't tell anybody. I put a 0 into it. That's all right. I called get to take a 0 out. I put another zero into it. So how many things are in the queue? One. And size returned minus one. <laughs> what went wrong? Can anybody debug that? There's my code. Yeah, the size is now really two. I put two things in, so I incremented the input pointer twice. It wrapped around to zero. I took one thing out, so the output pointer is now one. So I've said zero minus one modulo the size, which is two. But what is minus one modulo two? It's, it's plus one, right, obviously. Let's just try it in Erlang. 
oh darn, airline doesn't implement modulo, it implements remainder. And C does the same. So the problem here is that if this expression is ever negative, then I'm going to get the wrong answer. I'm going to get a negative result. So what I have to do to fix this is I have to make sure that this expression is never negative. How can I do that? Unsigned. Unsigned. Well, yeah, maybe I could do that. <laughs> I, I dread to think what would happen. But absolute value. Sure. OK, so let's do that. I fixed my C code. Let's uh, compile the C. And I'll just rerun that last test. And it passes. OK, so now I found a bug, a tricky bug. I created a test case that exhibited my bug. I fixed the code. My test passes. All my tests are green. I'm done, right? Shall I just run a few more random ones? Let's see what happens. Oh, no. It still doesn't work. Look, what happened here? I created a queue of size 2. Size 2. That's better. This is progress. Now it works for queues of size 1. <laughs> I put three things into it. Remember, it's really three, three slots in the queue. I called get once. So the input pointer wrapped around again. The output pointer is 1. I've taken 0 minus 1 modulo oh, 0 minus 1 modulo 3. That's 2, really. But what does my code compute? Well, the absolute value of minus 1 is plus 1. So absolute value is the wrong thing to do, not the right fix. What I can do is if I just add on another Q size here, whoops, if I type the right thing, That'll be enough to ensure that that's always possible, positive, and it doesn't change the absolute value. So if I compile this, now it's all to work. Yep, that test passes. I've learned my lesson. Let's run random ones. Oh, yes. There we are. 500 tests say it works now. Ta da OK. So there was a demo of debugging imperative code in this manner. Well, what can we learn from this? Well, one thing which I hope I've convinced you of is that the same property, the same specification, can find many different bugs. And this is something that we see happening again and again and again. And secondly, I hope you agree that those minimal failing test cases were quite easy to debug. This is something that we um, experience repeatedly also and that we believe in very strongly. So when you do random testing, then you get test cases containing a lot of noise. That is the purpose of random tests. But when you try and diagnose a fault, the last thing you want is a test case with 100 calls in, of which seven are relevant. So this process of shrinking we think of it as extracting the signal from the noise, presenting you with something where every call matters for the failure. And this, is, this transforms the usefulness of random testing. OK, that was a tiny, tiny example. You might be wondering, does it work on any, any larger programs? Well, we've spent a lot of time over the last few years uh, doing exactly this for real, using the same kind of specifications, the same uh, interface to see, to test out of our software, uh, which runs in cars. And we've been doing this for Volvo cars. So what is out of our software? Well, you probably know that a car contains a lot of processors nowadays, 50 to 100. And of course, they all need to be able to talk to each other. So the software that runs on them, it's going to be running different applications depending on what the processor is for, but they all need to talk to each other. In order to do that, they all run what's called the Altasar basic software. And this is a diagram of a, a large part of it. So you can see here, maybe on the right, there's an Ethernet stack. Because you, you might need Ethernet in a car. Um, the CAN bus 
is a, a very commonly used bus in vehicles. Lin and Flexray are other protocol stacks. The COM services up the top, that does kind of routing between one protocol and, and another. And the diagnostic cluster, that's the thing that remembers fault code 27. One of your cylinders didn't fire or whatever, so that when you take your car to the dealer, they can figure out what went wrong. So all of this stuff runs on every processor, but there's quite a lot of it. Each of those little colored boxes is a module and is specified by a PDF document. So there are what? How many are there there? It must be 20 or 30, just on this diagram. Now, you might think, since all these processes have to talk to each other, and they're all going to run this software, that the right thing to do would be to develop a single open source implementation that the entire industry would collaborate on. Wouldn't you expect that? But no, this is not what has happened. Instead, there are many competing suppliers. But there are standards documents that specify precisely how each of those colored boxes should behave. And thanks to the standard, car manufacturers can buy code from different providers on different processors, and they'll all work together seamlessly. <laughs> and if they don't, then the car manufacturer, the system integrator, who has bought subsystems from lots of different suppliers, has a huge problem. Because you put this stuff together, it doesn't work. The processors can't talk to each other. And then, what's, who is Volvo going to blame? They, have, they need to know who is following the standard and who isn't. And so they contracted us to develop quick check specifications of all of those boxes and use them for acceptance testing of the code that they were taking delivery of. So we found a lot of bugs in this code. Let me show you one of them. This is a bug in a CAN stack. So you need to know to understand this, that when you send a message on the CAN bus, um, its message ID is also its priority. So every message has a priority. Lower numbers are higher priority. In this test case, we sent a message with priority one. That was sent out on the bus. Now the bus is busy. It can only send one message at a time. And then we quickly sent two more messages with priority two and three. They had to be queued up, of course. And then we called the transmission confirmation uh, function, which basically tells the stack, OK, now the bus has fi finished sessing, sending message number one. Which message should it send next? Message number two. Which message did it send next? Message number three. I can show you why. So this CAN protocol is quite old. And when it was first designed, then CAN IDs were only allowed 11 bits. But remember, this is the message type. That meant only 2,000 different types of message in the entire car. It's just not enough for the modern car. So there's a new version of the protocol that allows extended, extended CAN IDs of 29 bits, which is what? Half a billion, it, it'll keep them going for a while. But of course, you may end up putting together processes that make use of the standard IDs also. So you have to know which kind of ID each message type is using, and you have to use the correct representation. In this particular stack, the CAN ID was always stored in an unsigned 32-bit integer. But look, the most they can be is 29 bits. So the top bits were spare. And so the very top bit was used to record an extended CAN ID, unsigned integer. What that means is that when you compare two message IDs to decide which message to send, you have to mask off that top bit. What you couldn't see in the test case before was that message priority two used an extended CAN ID. So the stack treated it as priority two to the 31 plus two. And that's why it was sent last. So, you might ask, does this matter? Well, the priorities are there for a reason. Everything talks on the CAN bus. The stereo, the brakes, everything. <laughs> so, 
So if you're in an emergency situation, don't fiddle with the volume on your stereo. <laughs> so it's important that the priorities are respected. So what I like about this example is that although it was a very low level error in C code, failing to mask off a bit deep inside this code, there was still a short sequence that could provoke it, which was quite easy to debug. And we could find that short sequence by random generation with quick check followed by shrinking. So what I showed you working on that tiny example of the queue also works for real and has worked again and again and again uh, for finding real deep bugs in automotive C code. So this was a, quite a big project. We read 3,000 pages of PDFs, <laughs> which turned into 20,000 lines of quick check. That might sound like quite a bit of specification, but it's simple code, like the code I showed you. It's just a lot of it. And we used that to test a million lines of C code from six different suppliers. OK, so we had six suppliers. So you might say, maybe each supplier sent us 160,000 lines. So our, our test code is one eighth the size of the real code. Uh, that's a pretty good ratio. We found 200 problems, of which more than 100 were in the standard itself. <laughs> I found one where there was a requirement stated in the standard in a little box, and then an explanation in the paragraph following, which directly contradicted the requirement. <laughs> what are the poor implementers to do? So, uh, you know, don't believe something is right just because it's called a standard. So this was a very successful project, and we're very proud of it. But I want to tell you about one more uh, great story. And this story begins with a message to the Erlang mailing list back in 2007. We know there's a lurking bug somewhere in the debts code. We got bad object and premature end of file every other month the last year. But we haven't been able to track it down because the debts file is repaired automatically next time it's opened. And this was a, a message from a, a guy called Tobbe Turnqvist, who works at Klarna in Sweden. So I'm sure we all feel Tobbe's pain. But what's the context here? So Klarna are a company that started in the mid-2000s to provide invoicing services for web shops. Maybe it doesn't sound very exciting, but it was a great business idea. Lots of people, apparently, don't want to give their credit card number to a web shop. And Klarna allows you to avoid that. You get an invoice instead. You don't pay till you get the goods. They have been growing like a rocket. They built their system in Erlang, and they used a database called Benizia to store all their data. This is a database that is distributed together with Erlang. It's used in many Erlang applications. You get transactions, replication, lots of good stuff. But it needs a back end to store its data. And if you store the data on disk, the back end that's used is called debts. That provides tuple storage in files. Debts is the component that Tobe was talking about. And when you have a bug that appears every couple of months, doesn't that just smell race condition to you? It did to me, and I was interested in them at the time. So I thought, oh, let's see whether we can find this bug using Quick Check. So in order to explain how we did that, um, I'm going to have to go from the sublime to the ridiculous and talk about testing one of these. Do you recognize this? Is my drawing good enough? So it's the kind of dis ticket dispenser you have at a, a bakery counter. And if I were to simulate that in Erlang, I'd need an operation to take a ticket. And every now and then, the roll of tickets runs out, and somebody has to come along and replace them. So let's have a reset as well. OK, so it's, it's very easy to imagine how to implement those. And it's very easy to write a unit test. Here would be an example unit test in Erlang. Uh, here, test dispenser just calls reset and take ticket. And I'm using Erlang's pattern matching to check that the result in each case is equal to the red thing on the left. So we're just comparing against expected results. So this is the standard way of writing unit tests, right? You, you call the API under test, and you compare the result against what you expect. And it's easy to model in QuickCheck as well. 
There's a sample test case I might generate. Hmm, how can I model the state of a ticket dispenser? Perhaps an integer. Sure enough, let's take an integer that maybe reset sets it to zero, and it's incremented by every take, and then the post condition for take will just check that take returns one more than the model state when it's called. So it's easy to do this testing, but these tests miss a very important part of the dispenser's behavior. What is the purpose of the ticket dispenser? It's to regulate the flow of a lot of concurrent customers to one bakery counter. So if I only test it sequentially, then I'm missing an important part of its behavior. What I really want to do is to run tests that look more like this. So this test is supposed to represent, first of all, resetting the ticket dispenser, and then two customers come along. And in parallel, one of them takes one ticket, and the one on the left, for some reason, takes two tickets. OK, so now let's think, what are the expected results? Well, the one on the left might get tickets one and two, and the one on the right, ticket number three. That would be OK, right? But it's not the only OK behavior. We might also see that the one on the right gets ticket number two. Maybe he kind of leaps in in between the, the left customer's two attempts to get a ticket. But that's all right. If the ticket dispenser does that, I'm happy. What it must not do is this, where both customers get ticket number one. So this is the problem with testing an API like this that is intended to be used in parallel. There's more than one possible correct outcome. So if your strategy of writing tests is to compare actual results to expected ones, you have a problem. Now here, you could, of course, enumerate the three possible correct results. The three results are where the one on the right gets tickets one, two, or three. And you could record the actual results and check that you got one of these correct ones. But this is a really tiny test. I don't want to just run tests like this. I want to run tests like this. Here I've got three customers, and two of them take two tickets. Oh, no, look, the third one isn't a customer. It's the service guy replacing the, the tape at the same time. How many correct results are there for this? I've worked it out for you. There's 30 correct outcomes. So the whole idea of comparing against known expected results just doesn't scale to this kind of test. Nobody in their right mind would try to predict all 30 correct outcomes. And anybody who did would get at least one of them wrong. So you just can't decide this kind of test in the usual way. However, what can we do instead? So here I have the first parallel test I showed you, but I've drawn it on its side instead. I think this is a correct result. If this happens, I'll be happy with the dispenser. But why is it correct? Well, I say it's correct because there's an order in which I could have done those calls that would have generated the results that we see. So if I can take a parallel test and find a way of interleaving the calls so that the result is consistent with a model, I'm going to say that the test has passed. If there's no such interleaving, then I've seen some behavior that can't happen in any sequential test. And uh, I'm going to say that that's wrong. OK, let's go back for another quick demo. I have uh, the implementation of the dispenser here. Let's compile it. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is run quick check, and I'm going to run sequential tests of the dispenser. And they all pass. So what does that show? That shows that the model I've made corresponds to the sequential behavior. And there's no point trying to use a model that does not correspond to the sequential behavior in parallel tests. Put it this way, if there's a bug you can find with a sequential test, why would you run parallel tests to look for it? It would just be crazy. So the sequential behavior and the model agree. Now let me run parallel tests. And the thing that I really like about this is that I'm using exactly the same model, exactly the same specification, just with a different property. 
Oh no, it doesn't work. And here you can see what happened. We did two things in parallel. Two customers took a ticket, and they both got ticket number one. Now up here, you can see the more complicated behavior that happened in the test I originally generated. So that is the unshrunk test case, which I think, you know, there's enough going on that you probably don't want to try and debug that. Um, so this is the shrunk result, and shrinking is equally valuable for parallel tests. Let me just run this again. Same result. Same result. You may see there's no possible interleaving. This is quick check saying that there's no way of interleaving these two calls to get these results. Let's run it again. So what I'm showing you here is that although this is non-deterministic behavior, it's a, a race condition, nevertheless, we can find it quickly every time, and we can shrink it to the correct minimal example every time. I, I really like that. OK. Um, that's the failed test case that we just saw. Here's the code I wrote for take ticket. Erlang doesn't have global variables, but I simulated a global variable and read and write. Read reads it, write writes it. But wait a minute, that's a critical section. Where's the synchronization? There isn't any. So, of course, there's a race condition in this code. And my point here is not that um, you know, this, this bug is hard to find, but that the technology works to find it very nicely. Let's talk about debts. Debts is a tuple store. Uh, Erlang tuples have curly brackets around them. And the tuples that you store in a file have a key in the first component and then a collection of values. And there are operations to insert a list of tuples into a table. To delete all the tuples with a given key, insert new is like insert, except that if any of the keys is already present, then it's a no-op, and that's atomic. So that's kind of nice. And there's some more stuff. None of that will surprise you. So how can I model a debts table? Well, it's almost as simple as just saying, let's keep a list of the tuples that should be in there. That's going to enable me to predict how these calls should behave. So my model is very simple. In fact, my model for the core of the debts API is less than 100 lines of Erlang. It's simple stuff. The implementation is in four different modules, and it's more than 6,000 lines. It's keeping hash tables on the disk and handling uh, legacy formats and all kinds of stuff. So there's much more code. Uh, but its intended behavior is very simple. So uh, this 100 lines of code took me uh, a few sessions of maybe an hour at a time to develop. And I, I, had to, I had to debug my spec a little. I didn't initially understand exactly what the operations were supposed to do. But quite soon, I was able to run sequential tests. And um, they all passed. So I knew my model was correct. And then I ran a race condition test. And again, it was exactly the same model, the work of moments, to convert it into a race condition test. And here's what happened. OK, so here in the, in the sequential prefix, we open the file. That seems reasonable. And then in parallel, I inserted an empty list of tuples. That's a no-op. And that returned OK. And another process called insert new to insert an empty list of tuples. That's also a no-op. And that returned OK. But QuickCheck says there's no possible interleaving of these two results that can explain the values we see. That's odd, isn't it? What on earth is wrong with returning OK in each case? Well, sometimes there's no alternative. You just have to read the manual. Here's what it says about insert new. Look at the result type. Even in Erlang, a bool is either true or false. It's never OK. And in thousands of sequential tests, insert new returned true or false every single time. I run it in parallel, suddenly it returns OK. Where did that come from? So I thought, oh, let's see what else we can find. 
ran some more tests. This happened. Um, OK, so I opened the file in the prefix, and then I started two processes. Each one of them inserted the same tuple, 0, 0. But one used insert, and the other one used insert new. And the test timed out. That seemed a little odd, really. And this message appeared. I wondered if there was a bug in my code, but when I got this error report, debts, bug was found when accessing debts table, I thought, aha, uh -huh, OK, maybe this is a bug in debts. So I found these two bugs very quickly, and then I decided that insert new just doesn't work. So I changed my model to exclude insert new from the testing. And I found this one. OK, what happened here? In the prefix, I opened the file. And then in parallel, I did two things. Now, the first thing I did was open the file again. You might think that's a bit odd. But remember, Erlang is designed for highly concurrent systems. We expect thousands of processes to be using the table at the same time, and all of them will have to make sure it's open. So we expect one process to be opening the file while others are using it. So there's another process which is opening the file. Obviously, that shouldn't affect anything. While the second process inserts 0, 0 into the table, and then gets the entire contents. And it's the empty list. But I just put 0, 0 in there. How could it be gone? And indeed, I found this bug in several forms, where if one process is opening the table, another process can see a sequentially inconsistent view of the table contents. Well, so that wasn't good. So when I found these bugs, I sent them off to the guy who was maintaining the code, who worked at Ericsson. And he said, oh, thank you very much. Uh, next day, he sent me back a, a fixed version. So that's very nice. But I, I don't think these are the race conditions that are occurring at Klarna. At Klarna, the database is being corrupted. So hmm, maybe the file is being corrupted. With his help, I added one line to my property that just checked to see whether the file was corrupt after performing a parallel test. And then I started running random tests. I had to run tests for several minutes <laughs> to find this one. OK, what's happened here? In the prefix, I opened the file. I closed it. I opened it again. And then I did three things in parallel. A lookup of the key that wasn't there. And I, at the same time, I did two insertions of the tuple 0, 0. And everything said, OK. All those results, they're consistent with the model. But when I checked if the file was corrupt, I got premature end of file. Oh. Now I want to emphasize, this is the smallest test case that provokes this bug. I saw it, and I thought, open, close, open. Come on, that can't be necessary. <laughs> and so I took out the first open and close manually, and I ran the test with just the four calls tens of thousands of times. It passed every single time. And today I know why. It's because at the beginning of the test case, the file does not exist. That first open creates the file. Then we close it. The second open opens an existing file. It's very slightly different. We get into a very slightly different state, and that is essential to provoking the race condition. Now, I ask you to imagine any tester writing unit tests by hand who would include this one in his test suite. <laughs> it's just impossible. So I thought this was really great. And then I was due to give a talk at a developer conference in Denmark about something else. And I thought, no, no, this is a much better story. So I rewrote my talk uh, to talk about this. But I hadn't saved the output from QuickCheck when I'd run the tests. So I had to rerun it. And um, so that I could copy and paste the output onto my slides. And as I did that, what did I find but this one? OK, so in the prefix, we open the file. We insert a tuple into it with key one. And then in parallel, OK, the second process there is reopening the file again. We know that's a bit dodgy. But the first one looks up something that's not there and then deletes the key that is. And all those results, they're consistent with the model. But when I checked for corruption, 
I got a bad object exception. Here's the quote from the mailing list. The symptoms seem to be the same. I sent these examples off to the maintainer. In each case, next day, he sent me a fixed version. And that fixed code has been in service at Klarna for more than a year now. During all that time, there's been one bad object exception. When reading a file that was last touched before the new code went into service. So it looks as though those bugs really were the ones which, which by the time this was fixed, they were causing their main server to crash every week. So they were getting really pretty fed up with it. So what I really like about this story is that it illustrates the tremendous power of finding race conditions this way and minimizing the test cases. Before I did this work, the guy responsible for the code had spent more than six weeks at Klarna trying to figure out what on earth was going on. And at the end of that time, he and the other people working on this thought, it seems to happen when the database is about one gigabyte. Maybe it's something to do with rehashing. When we finally found the bugs, you needed a database with at most one record <laughs> and either five or six calls to reproduce it. And in each case, given that tiny example, it took less than a day to find and fix the race condition. So what does this show? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't reflect at all on the, the very competent people who have been looking for this bug previously. What it shows is that trying to find this kind of race condition from failures in production where billions of irrelevant things have happened, as well as the five or six that are actually responsible, it's just a hopeless task. OK, well, those were a number of stories about successes that we've had with QuickCheck. Uh, what would I claim? I think the property-based testing finds more bugs with less effort, don't like tests, generate them.